Good evening, El Paso. Welcome to Philosophic Dialogues from La Fentera, the student edition, where we share the fun and the big questions with you. My name is Ashley Trojanowski, and I am a biology student here at EPCC and a student fellow for the EPCC UTEP Humanities Collaborative. Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Sarah Martinez. She is amazing and my favorite professor here. Dr. Sarah Martinez has a bachelor's in biology and Latin American studies from Bowdoin College and a PhD in molecular biology from the University of North Texas. She runs EPCC Crochets, a service learning program that is dedicated to making nests for local wildlife rescues, and she is also an official El Paso ambassador. Hello, Dr. Sarah Martinez. Hi. <laughs> Happy to be here with you today. My first question. Personally, while attending my science courses, I hear a lot of my peers reaching out to me and saying that they feel completely drained um, from their coursework and studies. I feel, great, I feel a great deal of concern for this since we're only in the first step of our upper academic journey. Have you ever felt this way or have your friends ever felt this way? I think that for any student, there's going to be that transition between you know, high school life to college life. And for me, it, what was especially difficult is because I went to school far away, I went from being a big fish in a little pond to being a very small brown fish in a frozen pond. <laughs> if you don't know where Bowdoin is, it's in Maine, so it's cold there. <laughs> um, but I just learned that I didn't have the skills I needed to succeed in that environment. And I think that a lot of students struggle with developing these skills and maybe feeling behind and this is, has a huge draining effect on them. So it took me a while, it took me a, a semester of failure before I figured out how to ask for help my, from my professors, from uh, just the tutoring centers, from peer networks, how to study so that I could tackle these dense topics because I went in wanting to pursue science, and then science hit me in the face. You know? <laughs> so I had to adjust to this new rhythm. And once I got there, I, that feeling behind, feeling overwhelmed, feeling drained, that dissipated. But you have to build your network, and you have to build those skills. How have you dealt with the pressure to be perfect or to perform as if you were always perfect? Or did you ever feel like you had to perform? There's definitely that pressure to succeed. That's what I feel more than anything. Uh, I felt this going you know, far away to school, being the first person in my family to pursue a PhD, right? These are all extremely you know, un untypical things, things that are not typical, especially in our community. So I felt this pressure that I had to do these things, I had to succeed. Uh, but perfection is something that I learned to get over rather quickly. <laughs> um, and in fact, in science, it really lends itself to learning how to fail. When I would set up experiments and everything was just so, and then they fail, you learn that there's, you know, it's not a, a good idea to put energy into being perfect because it's not always going to work out the way that you plan. And failure is a part of learning, it's a part of science. And I try to build a safe environment in my classroom as a result of that. You have the freedom to fail and to figure out how to recover from that because some students get too in their head, too much about perfectionism. And if you go on to study science or anything at an upper level, you're going to learn that there's going to be a lot of obstacles along the way and how you handle them is ultimately going to dictate whether or not you get out with your degree. You know, it's a competitive, a really competitive um, journey trying to get into universities, especially the top tier universities. And it's a lot of students feel the need to be perfect because others to them are perfect. How do you try to not compare yourself to those students that are seemingly perfect? I think that what you just said is the key. You cannot compare yourself to someone else because all students have a different journey. You know, what may look like something that's maybe not as significant or impactful in someone's resume could have been such a huge deal to them. You know, we're all overcoming different barriers. We're coming from different backgrounds. I love working at EPCC because we get so many different kinds of students. We have students who cross from Mexico every day. We have students who come from military background. We have 
early college high school students, right? All of these students have a different background, different things that they're trying to overcome to go through school. And I would like to think that people who sit on these admissions teams, that they take these into account. And so when students come to me for advice, like, oh, how do I make myself stand out? I always say truly tell your story because I feel like that really helped me to get the scholarships that I needed to go to school, uh, to go, get to go to school to somewhere so fancy, <laughs> and then getting into graduate school. I just truly showed everything I had went through and how I overcame so many things, my path, how I learned. And I think that, honestly, that is what colleges look for. They look for how adaptable is this person? How do they learn from their experiences? What is their background like? Because in fields like science, diversity really helps our drive our field forward. If we look at the recent COVID-19 you know, pandemic ongoing, right? Development of those vaccines came from people of color, right? People who overcame those barriers, who didn't put themselves up against people who come from backgrounds of privilege. You know, they went through school and they overcame all these different obstacles that often people of color experience that, you know, maybe people who come from a more privileged background do not. And we got this innovation, right? These innovations come from all walks of life. Our beautiful brains, that, that bell curve, right? They, they're from everywhere. So when you're building, you know, a, a incoming class at a, a top tier university, you're looking for, yes, students who stand out, but also people who have really, you know, overcome a lot of things and bring these diverse backgrounds because if it's all a bunch of people who all came from privilege and they all have perfect scores, well, okay, so what, <laughs> you know? Do they know how to learn? Do they know how to innovate, right? People who have gone through more in their personal lives, I think they have that edge. Do you have any advice to alleviate your anxiety or stress or for the students that do focus on that, how they can not focus on it as much? So practice, right? <laughs> practice failing. <laughs> I know this sounds silly, but don't be afraid to give wrong answers, right? I know that I, I encourage a lot of participation and sometimes students will not participate because they're afraid of being wrong. Don't be afraid, practice being wrong. Recovery is so important. And then as far as anxiety, I think that building a network really helps to alleviate that just talking to other people who are at the same level as you, going through the same stuff as you, it really helps to you know, just get those anxieties out when you share that experience. And you do a great job oh. with that. <laughs> That's if, nice to hear. For those who don't know, <laughs> in our classes, in our lectures, she asks people to write on the whiteboard what you think the answer is or what your, you know, your best answer is. And if it's wrong, it's okay. You still get the points and she just does it for participation and it's really nice for a professor to do that. I think it's a much more fun class if we're all participating <laughs> than if we're, you know, afraid of being right the whole time. For the students who want to pursue such a long and difficult degree in STEM, like medical uh, degrees, PhDs, how do you not burn out? What was your advice for not burning out? Burnout is very real, especially as you get towards the end of your academic journey. I know for me, the last maybe three or two years of my PhD program were extremely intense. And a lot of that is from just my personal experience where my major professor left the university and that made it very difficult for me to go through and finish up my experiments. And I didn't have a lot of support there. So things that I would do would be to participate in peer groups. So we had graduate societies for microbiology and they were just a way to blow off steam. I also t took up crafting, <laughs> which kind of, it's funny, but um, it, it came in later in life. Right now I run EPCC crochets, but it just allowed me to feel like I was completing something instead of, you know, always worrying about the pending dissertation, the pending experiments, you know. I could finish things and that gave me a sense of accomplishment because when you are building for six years, 
something that at the very, you're just waiting for this pinnacle moment, right? It can be very stressful and very wearing on you personally. Uh, I have a great family who, you know, supported me through this. That's unusual usually in, in Latino communities. There, there's this misunderstanding of, well, why do you have to go? You know, why, why can't you be here? Mm -hmm. That sort of thing. But they were, they were great in supporting me through graduate school. And, you know, I have a, a dog. <laughs> <laughs> a very cute one. <laughs> yes. I, I, I tell this story a lot where I, when I was doing my qualifying exams, if you're not familiar, qualifying exams are when every person in your committee gives you an exam and you have to complete it. And they're usually uh, not open note or anything. It's just you're demonstrating your knowledge of the subject. So when I was going through my qualifying exams, having my dog there to remind me that you are in fact a human, uh, you need to take me out on a walk, <laughs> you know, <laughs> instead of just studying and studying and writing and writing, you know, she really helped keep me grounded. I, I think that that's the beauty of animals, right? They, they remind us of our humanity and that special relationship with them. Did you ever feel like any of your peers lost their humanity in the courses and became somewhat like a robot or just inhumane? I don't know about like a robot, but there was definitely people who were just not dealing with the burnout as well. Sometimes we, I was there, you know, three in the morning until like I was there more than <laughs> more than what it should have been. You know, I was sleeping there. I was setting up my experiments at three in the morning so that I could run them all day, teaching classes, taking classes, writing, all of those things. So yes, it can be very stressful, especially if you don't have a support network. If maybe you're far from home, you know, I was in Texas, but I had a lot of peers who were international students. So we lean on each other. But if you isolate yourself, then it becomes way more difficult and you start feeling the signs. And so in those peers, they would just, sometimes they would drop out of the program or they would take time off. I do know people who it took them 12 years to complete the PhD where, you know, normally like five, six years is typical. Mm -hmm. So, and life gets in the way, you know. But I think it's important to acknowledge your mental health and take the time you need because you cannot, perform well if you are that drained. Mm -hmm. So take a day, you know, <laughs> take a day to recover, walk your dog, <laughs> right? Call your family, call the people who love and support you, lean on your peers, otherwise you're just not going to finish. Do you ever feel like it's, or do you think it's necessary to overstudy in a particular subject? Or do you know like those students that just devote every second of the day to studying for an exam or a test or, you know, whatever it is. Do you think it's healthy to do that? Or I think that you need to develop a balance, right? It's important for you to live your life as well as study and learn time management, right? Be like, I'm going to dedicate these, you know, hours to studying. There's that, um, you know, 10,000 hour rule where you become an expert after p devoting that much time to a subject. Well, you have to put in that time, right? But it doesn't have to be all at once. It can be a little bit every day. And learning comes in many different forms. It's not just, you know, reading or going over questions. There, you need to give yourself time to process that information as well. There's only so much your brain can absorb. So if you're shoving in, you know, multiple hours and not having any time to process, you're not even retaining that information. You think you're preparing, but you might go blank on a test as a result. Right. You know, like in your experience, have you ever met those competitive students where they're like, oh, I only spent two hours sleeping this today and I studied for 14 hours. What did you do? And when you say, you know, I studied throughout the week, two hours a day, and they think, or they say comments like, you're not good enough or you're not putting as much effort as I am. Do you, did you ever have those? I don't peers? know that I've ever heard <laughs> that. That's interesting. It's <laughs> like, I studied longer than you competition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, some students will say, you know, oh, I studied 12 hours today. What did you study? And they're like, oh, two hours. And then they just kind of mark it down. Like you're not, you're not working as hard as they are. Um, do you ever, have you ever dealt with like a really competitive here? 
that was like competing over like everything, the smallest little thing? You know, in grad school, there was more of a competitive atmosphere than trying to collaborate and work with each other, like conviviality in a lot of the departments. It was unfortunate because I know other people who had positive graduate school experiences where they felt like it was family. I think that the strategy of dedicating a little bit of time, you know, every day to study and keep things in your mind, I think that usually has more success than cramming and not sleeping. Your body needs time to sleep. Mm -hmm. Sleep is so important. There's so many studies out there on sleep and REM sleep in particular. You're not going to get REM sleep in two hours. I don't care who you are. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. When you were in your burnout stage in your uh, you know, academic career, what did you do specifically that helped you alleviate stress? Oh man, I had to dig deep. <laughs> I had to dig so deep to pull that out of me. It, I don't know where it came from, <laughs> but perhaps it was that I had been experiencing, you know, this failure and recovering from it, right? So this give and take and knowing how to deal with it. And ultimately, I had been building for this all my life, right? I, I knew from a young age that this is what I wanted. So somewhere from deep inside myself, I knew, like, I just have to try a little more, right? And then things start clicking, things start coming together, and then there's your support network. People who you would not expect support you, um, and you just have to find them. Like I would be riding the elevator, exhaust, too exhausted for the stairs, <laughs> and then the maintenance man would get on, and you know, he, one day he was like, "I'm very proud of you, Mija," and because there were not a lot of women of color there at my program. So he, he was a stranger who acknowledged this accomplishment. So you take from the good to fuel you through those hard times. What year did you get burnt out? I would have to say it was around the third year, halfway through. <laughs> a lot of things happened during that year. I had been in a long-term relationship and that ended uh, my grandfather had passed away and he had been a huge supporter of mine going through grad school. Yeah, <laughs> it's one of my biggest regrets that he didn't get to see me graduate. And the last time I saw, every time I would leave, he would hold my hands and he would ask me how much longer. And so I told him about two years and he said, I I'll try to make it. And, mm -hmm. and he died the next week, it, you know, so a lot of things happened that year in addition to like my major professor leaving. When that happened, they started taking my equipment, they kicked me out of my lab, and luckily there was another professor there who kind of saw what was happening and didn't see that that was a fair occurrence just because I didn't have my major professor on campus, and he offered me space in his lab so that I could finish up the work that I needed to do since they were taking my equipment and my supplies, I pulled in every favor <laughs> that I had on that campus. All of the goodwill <laughs> I had built up during those early years, um, I cashed them in. <laughs> so <laughs> I had people who would hide the machines in their lab and give me access to them. I would call the companies and ask them for free samples so that I could finish up my runs. You know, you learn to adapt you learn to overcome because I was not going to allow all the hard work that I had done to be taken away by life events, by this man who decided he was going to leave the, the campus that I was at, right? I, I went in there fighting and, and I said, oh, I'm gonna show them, I'm going to do it. You know, when you dedicate so much time, so much effort, giving up would have been easy. Having a PhD is hard, and otherwise everyone would have one. And I think that finishing the PhD really helped me feel like, oh yes, you know, this is what I'm supposed to do. And then when I got the job at EPCC, and it was just such a wonderful, supportive environment, 
I love my colleagues. I love my students. My campus is great. Shout out to Mission. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a great place to grow your career for me. I feel like, especially now as tenure track faculty, that I am very valued at EPCC and I made the right choices to get to where I am now. This is where I've wanted to be, where I've been working towards. So there is a lot of reassurance, right? But, oh man, there were struggles along the way. And talking to people, having your support network, it just helped encourage me to keep going, right? There, were, there was the maintenance man and he came to my graduation. <laughs> he was awesome. And, but there were also lab instructors, you know, other people who saw how hard I worked and how much I wanted it. And they, you know, they supported me. There are plenty of amazing scientists out there who got a C and like, organic chemistry, <laughs> you know? And yeah, I, I got a C in organic yeah. chemistry, and I'm a good scientist, and, and I think a pretty good professor, too. <laughs> a very, the best professor. <laughs> do you have any advice or specific people students should reach out to? Do you think it should be like the TA first or the professor first? Or? Oh, that's hard. So where I went to school, there were not TAs, so that it's a little different. It's kind of like EPCC where we don't necess we don't really have TAs because our classes are so small. In a small class setting, you should definitely reach out to your professor, definitely, especially the first sign of struggle, like don't wait until the exam because even if we don't have the answer, we can point you to tutoring resources, to peer groups, to get you set up so that you succeed because ultimately we want you to succeed. At least I do. I really want my students to succeed. You're like my, my science children, right? <laughs> so every you know uh, nurse, every grad student that goes through me, it's, a little, it's me passing on that science information, right? And helping you guys succeed. Maybe even uh, the way that I approach studying and learning this very dense subject, maybe that's what you pick up from my class, right? All of these things, and, and that gives me a lot of sense of purpose, is helping students succeed. I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's uh, like, who should students reach out to specifically? Oh, okay, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so definitely reach out to your professor in a small setting. And sometimes TAs, you know, they're just stressed grad students, so they might not have the time or the energy to help you. So in that case, you might want to look into peer groups. So joining societies uh, like biology societies or other science societies, that is usually very helpful to build your peer network so that you help each other study. You know, even just talking to somebody uh, in your same class, doing a study group, that can often be extremely helpful in learning together. And if you're struggling in a class and you're maybe intimidated by the professor, <laughs> then look at the smartest person in that room, <laughs> the person who's like always participating and hang out with them. <laughs> because, you know, they'll show you their techniques, how much time they're putting in, and then you can maybe mirror some of those techniques and help. it'll help you improve. Do you have any advice for the students right now who are in their burnout phase? Oh yes. <laughs> so take your time, you know, it's very important to recover right so take the time you need but also let us know i am always so willing to help students who acknowledge that they're struggling and say you know i can't meet this deadline but can i do it at this time because it shows a willingness to continue and it shows that you are acknowledging your what's going on with you right you're taking care of yourself because we are not robots. We cannot just keep burning the candle at both ends, right? Because eventually you're gonna run out of stuff in the middle. So you need that recovery. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Dr. Martinez. It was so nice having you. And thank you so much for joining us today for the student edition of Philosophic Dialogues from La Frontera.